Today we're going to take a look at episode 12 of our trip with Dante through the Inferno. Uh, we're going to focus today on Canto 8, which is one of the uh, kind of forgotten cantos. Um, and I say that because it's usually not dealt with uh, very often because it serves almost as like a bridge canto uh, between Canto 7 and Canto 9. Uh, so when we left Dante last, he was um, he was really at the foot or at the, the the bottom of a tower, a giant tower um, that was going to lead him into this next level of the city of Dis. Um, and I think it's important to kind of say here where we are geographically. So Dante has been, you know, traveling downward since he entered in through those gates that said, uh, abandon all hope ye who enter here. Um, Dante has been on a continual trip kind of downward. He first crosses the, uh, the Asheron River where the ferryman Sharon ferries him across and he finds himself going through step by step uh, until we arrive finally at the River Styx which is our first if you want to think about hell as being this um, inverted cone that's been uh, created from the, the fall of Lucifer from the heavens and his battle with God. Um, four great rivers serve as borders to the different uh, the three different regions of hell and we saw the the Asheron was the first river that he had to cross to really get into hell proper. And then what we'll see as he moves from the sins of incontinence, the sins of the uh, the leopard, into the sins of, of malicious, or I'm sorry, the sins of violence represented by the lion, he must cross the river Styx. Um, and at the gates of this river, as he crosses, is this giant devil city called Dis, um, which is really the subject of Canto 9. And so Dante, at this point, has found himself kind of on the outside. Um, it's almost like he's catching his breath a little bit. Uh, you'll notice in this canto, he seems to gain a little more confidence than he had before. Um, Dante begins to, I want to say, instead of feeling the pity that we saw in some of the earlier cantos as he came across uh, figures that he spoke with, that spoke with him, figures that he recognized, He's now going to assert himself a little more as he starts to gain a little confidence, uh, but he still needs Virgil. Virgil is not quite ready to be abandoned just yet. And so I'm going to pick up uh, with Canto 8, and we're going to pick up, um, Dante has arrived kind of outside the gates, this giant tower, and he and Virgil notice, notice in the distance another tower, and they notice these signals, these fire signals that seem to be transferring back and forth between the two. Um, and it's almost a signal calling and immediately a, uh, a boat, a small skiff, is headed their way at like supersonic speed. Um, and Dante, you know, notices that there's a, a boatman above there, kind of like the Sharon figure we saw, only this now is the River Styx. So I'm going to pick up uh, around line 19. Phlegus, Phlegus, this time you shout in vain, my lord responded. He's talking about Virgil there. You will have us with you no longer than it takes to cross this muck. So Phlegus is this guardian. Um, he's uh, a boatman, but um, he's one of those kind of forgotten figures from Greek mythology. And so who Phlegus was, was um, he was originally a king who was known for making war on his neighbors. He had this special affinity for like starting trouble. Um, and he had a daughter, okay, uh, uh, Coronis. Coronis was uh, raped by the god Apollo, and she became pregnant. And while she was pregnant with Apollo's child, she fell in love with a human. Uh, Apollo became enraged, and um, he sent Hermes, his son, to kill Coronis and kill uh, the human that she fell in love with. Uh, which Hermes, they succeed in doing, but the baby is rescued. Well, Phlegus, the father of, uh, of Coronis, is so angry uh, with Apollo uh, that in his rage he set fire, sets fire to the, the temple at Delphi, uh, which is where the oracle for Apollo is housed, and he burns the structure down. And Apollo, in his vengeance, decides to get him back and, and have him killed and then tormented and sent into an afterlife where he's going to be tormented by, by many, many uh, troubles and demons. And so Phlegus is, is really the epitome of the angry ruler. 
Um, and he, he carries that angry and he lashes anger and he lashes out at everyone and anyone, including the gods. And for this, he is relegated to this role of being the boatman across the river Styx. But the first area outside of this tower that we see is um, is the boundary where we find the last part, okay, of the incontinence, which is be where we find the the wrathful, who are mired in this mud. And they are forever like angry and yelling and attacking one another. Um, and that's what Dante's gonna encounter. And so this boatman is angry that he has to take all this time and all this trouble to go ferry these two men. And Virgil reminds him, it's like, hey, again, we're on a mission for God. It's been ordained, you know, you don't need to give us any back talk. And then uh, Phlegus responds, as one who learns of some incredible trick just played on him, flares up resentfully. So Phlegus uh, there was seething in his anger. My leader calmly stepped on into the skiff, and when he was inside, he made me enter, and only then it seemed to carry weight. And there we see a continuation of what I spoke about before, which is the lightness and heaviness. Um, within this region, Dante carries the burden of, of his life uh, and as a living soul, not, not as a shade as these creatures are that he's encountering, Dante is physically heavy. Um, and he's also weighed down by, by, by the sins of his life. And so he causes this gift to sink a little bit. And, and Dante notices that about himself. Um, the lightness isn't there. Soon as my guide and I were in the boat, the ancient prow began to plow the water more deeply now than any time before. And as we sailed the course of this dead channel, before me there rose up a slimy shape that said, Who are you? Who come before your time? And I spoke, Though I come, I do not stay. But who are you in all your ugliness? You see that I am one who weeps, he answered. And then I said to him, May you weep and wail, stuck in here in this place forever, you damned soul. For filthy as you are, I recognize you. With that, he stretched both hands out toward the boat, but on his guard, my teacher pushed him back away. Get down there with the other curves. And so we see Dante for the very first time asserting himself and actually becoming a victim to this realm where he becomes angry at the shades. Like, who are you? Your ugliness deforms you. You have no, uh, no call to me. And uh, the cur that he's called, this kind of wild dog, this wild man that he's called, is pushed back down into the muck or the swamp that is the river uh, sticks by Virgil. And he says, away, get down there with the other curs. And then he put his arm around my neck and kissed my face and said, indignant soul, blessed is she in whose womb you were conceived. In the world, this man was filled with arrogance, and nothing good about him decks his memory. For this, his shade is filled with fury here. Many in life esteem themselves great men, who then will wallow here like pigs in mud, leaving behind them their repulsive fame. And so again, we have these forgotten souls. We don't recognize them. We don't know them anymore. They've become so like eaten up and disfigured by their sin that um, the world will not recognize or remember them at all. And so it's weird that uh, Virgil here kisses him on the cheek three times. Again, we have the number three, that trinity of kisses. Um, but then he, he also refers, he almost makes a reference, a biblical reference uh, to Elizabeth uh, calling Mary, okay, the, the blessed Theotokos, uh, blessed because of the, the, the uh, child she bears in her womb. Blessed is the one who's given you birth. Um, and it's an odd, odd description because Dante, the poet, is maybe making the suggestion that Dante the pilgrim does have this power. He's not Christ, but he may have that power to enlighten us, to, um, to change our ways and to, to become better human beings because of the story that he has to tell, the story that he has to live through. It's an odd placement. That's why I said this chapter is, is very strange, very strange. Okay. All right, and so he cont continues. So this is uh, um, Dante speaking now. Master, it certainly would make me happy to see him dunked deeper in this slop just once before we leave this lake. It truly would, and he to me, before the other shore comes into sight, you will be satisfied. A wish like that is worthy of fulfillment. 
Soon afterward, I saw the wretch, so mangled by a gang of muddy souls, that to this day I thank my lord and praise him for that sight. Get Filippo Argente, they all cried, and at those shouts the Florentine, gone mad, turned on himself and bit his body fiercely. We left him there. I'll say no more about him. A wailing noise began to pound my ears and made me strain my eyes to see ahead. And now, my son, Virgil said, come closer to the city we call Dis, with all its great walls and all its fierce citizens. And so the last we see of Felipe Argentini is he's being attacked by these other wrathful creatures who can't control their own anger. And uh, Argentini himself begins to attack and, and chew and eat himself. That's how much the sin has overwhelmed them, that they do not any more distinguish between the pain that they feel and their need to continue with the sin, you know, that, that occupies them so much. And so they draw to the city of Dis, and then for some reason they are not allowed entry. Uh, they are refused it. Virgil is stopped there and he tells Dante, I need you to stay here. Don't be scared. Our mission is worthy. Our mission has been approved. We will get past this, but I need to go talk to the gatekeepers. And as he approaches the gate, Dante becomes very scared and he begins to doubt. Uh, and he says, should I? Yes or no? Should I stay? Almost like the uncommitted. So Dante's almost backsliding. And again, he's not the Dante we're going to meet by the end of this, this journey. But this Dante is very much scared scared virgil comes back he's very much shaken but he says don't worry even though i look worried everything will be fine these spirits have refused us entry but there's going to be someone who's going to be sent an angel will be sent to unlock these doors for us they tried this once before uh with the with the gates to the entrance and so we hear this this kind of i won't call it foreshadowing but it's back shadowing uh, an allusion to the story when the first gates of hell with that uh, that sign that said abandon all hope ye who enter here there was a movement to shut those gates from outsiders from entering in and um, God sent an angel band to forbid that from happening so that sinners could enter and they did have a place the afterlife was not closed to everyone and so uh, we'll close this with a last look um, uh, of Virgil talking and speaking reassurance to Dante. He spoke to me, you need not be disturbed by my vexation, for I shall win the contest no matter how they plot to keep us out. This insolence of theirs is nothing new. They used it once at a less secret gate, which is and will forever be unlocked. That was the gate entryway to hell at the very beginning of this poem. You saw the deadly words inscribed above it and how already past it and descending across the circles down the slope open comes one by whom the city will be opened. So he points to an angelic figure who's going to open the gates for them. But Dante's not through with this like ship of horrors just yet. Um, and so this canto, canto, while it's a bridge between the sins of incontinence, those sins of uncontrolled id, and the sins that will open up to the intellect or begin the opening of the intellect, those sins of violence. Um, this canto is a very key canto. Uh, we see Dante changing just ever so slightly, um, and he will continue to make that growth as he goes through here. And I guess the, the lesson that we're supposed to take, or maybe that we could take from this, one of the truths that's possible in this reading is that um, the deeper we make our journey and the more faith we begin to have uh, in the things that are leading us on that journey, those guideposts that we have, whatever those may be, um, the more confidence we begin to build. It doesn't mean that one single victory will get us over the hump. Sometimes our way is paved by many, many battles that we have to face, and Dante certainly has several of those ahead of him. So we'll pick up next time with the City of Dis uh, and the Three Furies that will um, will block Dante's way, and we'll talk a little bit about what they might mean.